is our, our presenter is Susan Long. She's been in the dive industry uh, and a leader for almost 25 years and spent 21 of them as the CEO of DUI or Diving Unlimited International. Um, she now handles the sales and marketing for, okay, I'm gonna totally um, mess this name up, uh, Rocille Del Mar and Wino El Guardian Liveaboards in Mexico. <laughs> um, but Susan has been, <clears throat> was inducted in the Women's Hall of Fame in 2007. Uh, she's, she's been on the DEMA Board of Directors. Um, and since 2018, she's been one of the Board of Directors for the Women's Hall of Fame. And she has, definitely has a passion for diving and she's currently still in San Diego and she's an active part of our dive community. And I'm going to unmute Susan uh, at this point in time, which she could have probably unmuted herself anytime. So unmute if you can. And I'd like to introduce Susan Long, our presenter today, and she's going to be presenting on growing up in the dive industry. Uh, and it should be an interesting ride. So Susan, I am leaving this up to you. Okay. Oh, hang on. I just muted you, Susan. Wait, you have to unmute. Men have been trying to mute me my whole life, so. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. I hit the wrong button when I was saying, make you live video full screen. So I've got the, I got the floor then, is what you're telling me. You have the floor, it's all yours. Uh, okay, okay. So uh, thank you first, Jack, so much um, for uh, asking me to participate today. Um, I was quite, uh, taken aback actually, and, uh, and I'm honored to be here, so thank you. And I see some faces that signed on, my friend Ivana, Paul, uh, Sue's on there, my friend Valerie, so I see some people that I know and that is so awesome. Um, today, you asked me, let's see, so we're doing kind of a th threefold, but I think the first two are gonna be a little bit bigger. Uh, one is growing up in the dive industry. The second one was uh, what it was like to be at DUI. And the third one is what am I doing now? And I, as a person, I have a tendency to really focus on the fun stuff, the good stuff. Of course, there's challenges through everything through life. And uh, this is also something I want to be that's very participatory. I used to give a lot of tours at DUI and I am not here to do any type of a lecture. This is supposed to be, I, I always like them to be fun and interactive. And I know Jack said that the questions had to be pertinent to what we were discussing, but that's not true. Okay, so if there's something uh, you wanna ask, just go ahead for it and, and we'll try to do that. Might jump around a little bit, but I think that's okay because um, uh, something might spark just another memory. So, okay, so I hear everything okay? Okay, um, Facebook is, is doing a little bit of a lag on this, and it may be for some reason on Facebook to showing me, but it's not supposed to be. So, but go ahead and go. But we're good. Okay. Yeah. All right, then. So, just to kind of uh, let you know about me. So, I was born in 64. I have two younger sisters. Um, I had an older half sister, but I have two younger sisters, um, and and my mom and dad. So we were born here in San Diego. Um, mom and dad had a dive store, and I like to throw in my mom because a lot of people don't know about my mom um, because uh, everybody knows my dad, Dick Long. And uh, so when I grew up, so we had a dive store. And first it was, I know there was one on University Avenue, a small one, and then a bigger one in La Mesa uh, that is now, uh, was a bicycle shop for years. And then they moved down to Delavan Drive where the, where the factory is at now. And uh, we had a, I have so many really cool memories of things and growing up, like my, for example, I mean, I mean, a lot of you probably have parents and things like that that grew up scuba diving. So what 
like my dad always had a, a perpetual Farmer John tan, always, you know, with the, with the Farmer John wetsuit tan. And he would uh, go out all the time he was diving and my dad worked a lot. So, uh, and he, they were big hunters. We had so many abalone fries. Um, we, we the, the, the shop, I mean, everything was always about the shop, the shop, the shop. But uh, we'd have abalone fries. People would, they would get the abalone. And I think every week there was an abalone fry and the kids would run around and play. But we used to have abalone fries all the time at home and be like, dad, we have to have abalone again. And we had hundreds, probably hundreds of shells in the backyard. And my dad would pay my sister Kathy a buck and ab to clean them. Ooh, but <laughs> Sister Kathy was quite industrious. And we had one of the best little gardens you ever did see because it had nothing but abalone guts and fish guts and put in there often. So growing up, I, I mean, it's hard to kind of focus thing. It's kind of like telling a fish what water's like because that's all we knew. And, but we'd go down to the store when I remember very distinctly down in, um, uh, down in when it was on you know, on Delavan Drive, and my sisters and I would go play. So you know what I I have some pictures. So I want to share some sc my screen here, and let me know. Here we go. All right. So Jack, give me a thumbs up. Is is it working? All right. Super duper. So here's some kind of these are fun pictures of my mom and dad. So you look at those lobsters that they had there. I mean. Things were just different then. Of course, now if we see a lobster, all yay, run for it, go. But that's not, you know, that was just how things were back then. And my mom was a big time. She loved to spear fish. And so this is a, a couple pictures so that my dad and my mom, Janice. And then, uh, so growing up in the dive industry, my mom worked at the store. She worked making custom wetsuits and all of that stuff. So you probably think, so this is me uh, in the store. This, this, had to, this was in La Mesa. And you might think that this is my first wetsuit. So I, April 1966, so a year and a half or so, a little more than a year and a half. And uh, so this is me. And actually, that's my mom standing back there. I don't know who this scary eye guy is. Just stranger danger, stranger danger. So Person in that suit? Huh? <laughs> Was there actually a person in that suit or was, or was no. it? No, it was just okay. a hard hat that uh, display that they had. So okay. I, um, but that's why I said stranger danger. I'm just having fun. So this, my little wetsuit, and I still have this little wetsuit. It says Skin Diving Unlimited, home of tailor-made wetsuits on the back. And actually, and my mom had made that. And she said tailor-made. She wanted to say custom-made, but she ran out of the letter C. So she couldn't, she couldn't say custom made, but I still have this wetsuit. But it wasn't my first wetsuit. <laughs> Having been the first board in the family, I got, I guess, all this stuff. So I was, what, four months old? Mom made me a little wetsuit with booties and a jacket and a hood. So, and I don't know how... I wouldn't do this now. I can't even imagine how they got me uh, to sit on a lobster. I have no idea. But I just love this picture. And um, so this was just, this was life. You know, they always came home with something to eat. And here's some pictures kind of of the store. As you, uh, if you've ever been down to the factory, I don't, we don't have, um, they don't have the double doors anymore, but we did keep that sign. And this is kind of what the store looked like. It had so much stuff in it. Uh, my dad told me that he sold more US divers equipment out of that one store than all the rest of the dealers combined. And I mean, they had so much stuff. And as little kids, we always had, I mean, now it's normal for kids to have masks and snorkel. Well, when I was young, and I mean, we were some of the only kids and we had stuff when we were small. So we had masks. And then I remember getting a snorkel and being taught how to use that. Uh, dad would come home. Sometimes he had these little tanks and um, he'd let us use them in the swimming pool. So this was what the store looked like. 
and we'd go down on a weekend or something and bring the dog and my sisters and I would go back and, and the vending machines and get a moon pie and a soda pop and then uh, go into one of their, there were two dressing rooms that were just like a closet and we'd go in there and we'd pretend like we were going to space. So, but we'd just go down there, hang out. That, I don't think that was my mom, but it could have been my mom right there. So I remember this quite well. Uh, you can see the store. I love this picture because it just says everything in it. That was my mom, my dad's uh, assistant right there. And uh, with the little, the little go-go outfit, that was my, and there, of course, you see my dad with his clip-on tie and his polyester pants. And, um, and so you see all those windows and stuff, all that's still there. Uh, this is Bob Stinton, who worked with my dad. Well, I think it was employee number three, because mom would have been two and dad would have been one. And then Bob Cranston, uh, you know, who's just looking like a kid there. And he became a fabulous underwater, well-known videographer and photographer and made movies and it's just and it's just so fun to to look at this picture i also remember uh, my dad having an office and he had one of those speakers on it when that's when it was really cool and new to have those and my sisters and i we'd go in and we'd hang out in his office and i really i wish i remember who it was but somebody would, some man there at the office would pretend uh, like he was Charlie and we were Charlie's angels. Oh, <laughs> well, hey, before I get to this, I just have to say too, I learned how to drive uh, when I had my, you know, 15 and a half and I had my um, driver's permit and my dad would let me go down on weekends with him when everything was pretty much closed. This was, I, uh, and there was like a back parking lot and he'd let me just do circles around the parking lot these big big like not big figure eights uh in the company uh ford pinto wagon and i would just at for an hour an hour and then and then he let me do that in the we had a ford pickup truck and uh i actually kind of mistook the brake for the gas the gas for the brake and kind of dinged in and gnashed in one of the, one of the, um, you know, the tail lights. But anyway. We're so was that, so was that the area where the warehouse was and all the yeah, storage all containers? That, all that area. And there weren't the fences, the outside fence like there is now. Uh, so it was a little bit wider, but he just let me go circles and circles and circles, you know. Um, now, this is kind of a cool photo. You can see this. This is the hot water girl. This kind of shows how things were a little different back then. So we had the store and then there was manufacturing where we made uh, wetsuits and commercial dive gear. And this was from the commercial dive days. And hey, also I want to point out, uh, they used to make a lot of underwater um, uh, umbilicals for hot water suits and things like that for commercial diving. And we, because we bought Dad bought so much uh, hose from Goodyear. We got to go up in the Goodyear blimp twice, twice, which was very cool. And it was a lot noisier than you would think it would be. So um, during the commercial dive days, yes. Yeah, so marketing, you were a marketing person, right, Jack? Would you, what do you think of this marketing ad here? Yeah, times have definitely changed. Um. <laughs> <laughs> So the hot water girl here, it, that, it's just so fun to look at this. Um, and mom and dad would go to the ADC show and they'd have, you know, hospitality rooms and mom would come back telling us stories about that stuff. And so this was, I also like this old picture of uh, when the, you know, the astronauts would go into space and then they'd come back down and the divers that would take them and help them out of their capsules, they were always wearing um, diving unlimited wetsuits. So that was always Didn't cool. Didn't know that. That's... Yeah. So that was always cool. Oh, and uh, growing up in the diving store too, another thing that I think about, like my dad had the coolest, uh, he made this uh, Creature of the Black Lagoon uh, costume. 
not just a head, it'd be a whole costume. Because imagine the things you can do with rubber, because they, they had all this neoprene. So they made all these scales, and he had the best creature of the Black Lagoon costume. Um, also, too, when we were kids, my dad had to buy uh, a tank. He, well, he had a test tank, because they used to test um, commercial dive gear in the back was this big red tank. I don't know, you know, 12 feet deep, something like that, and it was round. Then he wanted to put, then he purchased another tank, which was even cooler, because we were kids and we saw this, and he, um, that had, it was glass in the front. I don't even know where he got it, but it was whole glass in the front, and I think it was seven feet deep, and but it was glass and it had doors that opened up and it was in the parking lot. And in the summertime, he'd let us go down and swim in that one. He'd let us go in the red one, but we didn't want to go in the red one because the red one was all gross on the bottom. But this one had glass and it was so cool. But he, when he bought it, I guess he had to buy this blue bus to go with it. I don't think it was blue at the time, but somehow and then we had this big blue bus thing that became a camper. So, but, uh, you know, as I said before, it's like trying to tell a, a fish uh, what is water. And that's just what it was like. And uh, things got tough sometimes. I mean, when things got, when I was probably about 14, things got um, hard. Uh, I remember 14 or 15, my mom and dad thought that that they were, that something happened and they got in a hundred uh, million dollars in debt. And they came home. And they said, we've lost everything. We've lost the house, the business, everything. And somehow they pulled it off and they were able to save the company. Uh, and they were able to save the house and all that. Um, and they, that they worked their heinies off to make sure that that happened. And actually hindsight being 20, probably some of those um, struggles uh, cost them their marriage. So, um, you know, so, you know, there's, Good and bad and everything, um, but I just I have some one some of those wonderful memories uh, about growing up in the dive industry. Did anybody ask any questions or about that? Because I I know I've kind of skimmed along some things. Um, no, not yet. But um, so during that hard time, was that during the hot water suit era? Because um, you oh. said you're, you you would have been. 15 you said yeah uh, I so it's like mid 70s right yeah so i was trying to think too i remember we were trying to help out at home and dad brought home some hot water gloves and my sister, sisters and i we would glue hot water gloves in um the garage those were the ones they had like big fingers and so those were a little bit easier like uh like uh sexy ladies wearing here so we would help try to glue some of those things in the garage and help out where we could, you know. So everybody doing more than one job, literally. Oh, yeah. It, it happened at an early age. And then when I, I started working at the company when I got out of um, sophomore year in high school. So the next day I went to go to work at the company. And my first job there was sewing. And I made one of the first uh, 400 gram fence slate out jumpsuits. And it was actually for the military. So I was sewing and I'd help sew uh, these polar bear packs that we would make. And these polar bear packs, it was kind of interesting. It was to go inside a diving bell. And if for any reason, I think the, the diving bell got separated from the surface that the divers who would be able to survive. And so they would pack a sleeping bag and a parka and boots and piddle packs, which we just thought was the most hilarious thing in the whole world. And they put it all into this container. I mean, this cloth, this fabric thing with lots of laces on it. And they lace it up so they'd stuff it full. And then two people would be on either side of it with like a, uh, a wooden dowel and they pull it apart and then somebody in the middle would be hitting it with a baseball bat to compact it as small and as tight as it possibly could be so uh yeah I remember those yeah when people would be making those so I actually helped make some of the outsides of those things and so and then after that 
Uh, so I was in sewing for a few months, a couple, you know. Um, so, yeah, I have, so I was I have helping a, to sew. So I have a question yeah. on, so when you started working there, um, are there still people working at DUI today? Well, besides your dad, um, that are working at DUI when you first started? Well, the, the main one I would say would be Bob Stinton, of course. Okay. Because uh, Bob Stinton, uh, I mean, he, he's not there anymore, but he was there up until after, he was there after I left. So I've known Bob Stinton my whole life. Well, the, other, the other one is maybe Dion? Dion, oh my gosh, yes, well, I was going to say that too, Dion, and then Pam, I uh, remember when I was 16 or 17, um, I remember them coming over to the house, and oh yeah, I've known Dion a long time, I mean, and that jumps me into kind of the, the next segment too, um, uh, we'll get there, okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll get there in just a minute. But like, uh, so I sewed, and then I glued, I was gluing wetsuits, and that's when we used to make, um, we used to make uh, search and rescue, SAR, rescue swimmer suit ensemble, and where we'd make the, it was all custom for each swimmer, and we'd have a wetsuit and boots and gloves and hoods, and oh, and we had that seam coat, every seam too. Uh, I wasn't the neatest person about that, but at least, I mean, I probably got as much on my clothes um, glue as I did on to the suit, or at least it looked like that at some time. So I did that. And then my next job, as soon as I got my driver's license, I got to be the company courier. So after school, when I get off school, my sister and I would go down there and I would run all the errands. I'd do the bank runs. And this was before, I mean, like there wasn't a lot of everything now, everything but it shipped. But then I'd go pick up hot water parts. Uh, all over town, I take shipments down to Burlington Northern to the airport because we were shipping things overseas. Um, and I would, I got to go on, I would deliver and pick up on all the military bases. So I went to Subdev, NOSC, Miramar, North Island, um, all of them. And I got to, I got to walk on ships. Um, I was 16, walking on ships, delivering things or picking things up. Uh, that was, I really, I mean, I like doing that, you know, so um, that's what, that was that job, and uh, I pretty much did that, and my sister worked in the office, and, oh, <laughs> this is kind of funny, because we had a telex machine, so this was way before faxes and all that, they had a telex machine, and you had to type everything in, lowercase, uppercase, you know, uppercase numbers, it was quite intricate, all these these big keys. So you type it in and you run this tape and then you'd hit send. So that way you're sending it all at one time because to keep the cost down. Well, I remember one time my sister had to have been 15 maybe. And uh, uh, she got a big like $25,000 hot water suit order. They had no idea they were dealing <laughs> with somebody who was 15. You know, they're sending their order to Kathy. <laughs> You know, and um, and then, of course, another thing that's cool about growing up in the dive industry and our family business, I knew what a resale number was before. Most most people probably still don't even know what a resale number is. So you gain all that kind of innate knowledge just by being around it all. But there was so many, there was really cool, like uh, Vic Gowan, he worked with my dad for years as his assistant. And um, I know there's a plus, special place in heaven for him. And um, so there's been a lot of good things, or KPS, my sister and I, at one time, when things were really tight, we were shipping and receiving. And the dish packs that you still use to this day, because they would be attached, we just like do the karate chop, you know, so, so that way you can pull them up. And um, yeah, I've and always wondered why they're always attached like that. It was <laughs> we used to karate chop those. And uh, then the tape, they didn't, we didn't have tape. It was like this paper tape that had to go through to get liquid on it to close everything up. So especially when things were, were tight and things were downsized, we just kind of jumped in and did whatever we could help mom and dad with. But we, we, we did get paid minimum wage for that. So. Right. That's um, not that I was in the dive industry, but I did also grow up in a environment with a family business and, and family members always got wrangled into doing something. Um, 
in my case, I was kind of lucky. I was the youngest, so I kind of was excluded. Um, um, but I, I think it's great that you took an interest in, in the family business in that way. Um, cause I know for me, it was like, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, cause that's, that's the family thing. You know, I wanted to do something different. So by you getting, you know, having interest in it, that, that's awesome. Well, actually, it's funny that you say that. That's a very nice segue because maybe you didn't know this because I worked in, I worked at the company two years in, during high school. I'm two years out of high school. Then I left. I wanted nothing to do with scuba diving, nothing to do with the family business. I actually learned how to dive. I took a dive class because by then we had sold the retail portion or dad had sold the retail portion. And so he was just focusing on manufacturing at that point. And I took a class. And I got a beautiful custom wetsuit made by Diving Unlimited. And um, my, there was my class. And then my dad took me diving on his boat, Research One. And I remember being seasick. We swam. It was dark and it was cold. And we didn't find even one fish. And we got caught in the kelp and had to come up far away from the boat. And I remember, just let me die here. You know, that kind of a thing. So anyway, I left the company. Um, at that time, and so I was, what, 20, 21 or something. So I went and I did my own thing. I, I worked for an off-premise catering company, but the big thing is I worked for Marriott Hotels for eight years and uh, started as a catering secretary and left eight years later as a director of catering. Lived in San Diego, Anaheim, New Orleans for two years, right outside of Washington, D.C., and then, uh, and then actually, so kind of the diving thing where I got back into diving was when I was living in New Orleans, my dad and his lovely wife, Lee, uh, invited me to Bonaire. And uh, I went down there for four days, went diving for the first time in, since then. And I had a ball. I, oh, I remember my dad. I said, hey, dad, can we do the helm of hooker? He's all like, you want to do the helm of hooker? And I'd go and side he's going, so <laughs> so we did that and I said next year dad you just tell me where you're gonna go and I will meet you there and actually um, I was living in Washington DC at that time and uh, um, and they picked Rotan Honduras and I met them there for, for a week had a blast and then actually when I worked at Marriott it was it was a great company for promoting and moving and learning. Um, if that's what you want to do, it's a really great company for that. You work really, really hard. And at that time, you know, I was kind of moving, I was working for the next promotion or the, the next um, relocation. And I decided uh, I'm going to go move. And I lived on, I went down, I sold or gave away everything I owned. And I went down to Rotan Honduras. And I ran a little resort down there in, ha called Half Moon Bay Cabins for a little over a year. So I did that, thinking I'd be staying there. Uh, but then, you know, you're living in a third world country. Uh, they treat women a lot differently uh, there. Hello. Um, so I ended up coming back and I started work. Dad uh, let me come back and start working for him temporarily. And Hello. Hi. Whoops, we got somebody who's chit-chatting. I, I don't know where that's coming from. You're good. So I came back again temporarily. And so here's um, this is a cute picture of dad and I. Oh, hey, I, I remember, Jack, you like the newer logo better. So you can even see it here. Here's dad's. There's mine. <laughs> That's 2006. But the, when I first came back, again, like I said, it was temporarily. So temporarily at DUI. And the thing I noticed right away was it was the people. And uh, it's the employees, because I knew, I knew many of them for years, like you said, like Dion and Pam and Bob and, um, and people in production that I recognized because I had worked with them for so long and there's Carol. So I came in and there was all these empo am amazing employees. And then meeting the customers and the customers, it was really important to the customers what we did. I mean, we gave them the ability to do things that they didn't think possible. And um, 
you know, and I used to joke with uh, people, I said, wow, well, working here at DUI, it's a lot better than selling insurance. And we get to deal with people that are mostly really excited to be diving and get a dry suit. And that, and, and then I remembered growing up and my parents almost losing everything and, you know, the countless stories we have no, not enough time for, but they're just realizing this has to go on. So I, you know, after I've been there for a little bit doing customer service, um, helped in marketing and customer service and doing DEMA shows and stuff like that. It wasn't very long. I went and I told dad, I said that I, 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 I wanted to run the company. So we put together kind of a plan and it was a loosely laid plan, but kind of things worked out and, you know, being in sales and then um, running sales and, and then operations popped up. There were, that needed to be taken care of. So we had a plan and things just kind of unfolded. But the thing I just want to show you most, especially when you look at this picture, this picture is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, you'll notice everybody's wearing green because uh, we used to uh, give out, you know, DUI still does that, I'm sure. Um, I experienced one of those. A big chunk, okay. So <laughs> a big chunk of the profits at the end of the year. And that was the best day of the year at DUI. Uh, probably even better than people receiving it, it was a blessing to be able to give it. And that was the best day of the year. And it got to learn to be called Green Day. And then we all started wearing green. And that was just the best day of the year. So that's why everybody's wearing green. And you see Faith in there. And I mean, just so many incredible faces. So we had Bob. Uh, and I remember Bob Stinton, when I first started working there, he told me, here at DUI, you could be a big fish in a little pond. And I always will remember that. And, um, but there was all the people. So the best thing, so I worked kind of my way up and I remember one of the first things I had to do, we had a operations manager and it was very sad One, I mean, he'd been with the company a while and unfortunately he went home one day for lunch and had a stroke and never came back. And that's kind of when I said things kind of loosely happened. And all of a sudden I became, um, operations manager and we needed to renegotiate our lease. Nothing had been done. You know, like one of these things kind of like just kind of piles on, oh, we'll get it to it later. And all of a sudden we had to renegotiate the lease. So I remember trucking on down the street to the landlord and having a conversation with this man and uh, just, you know, trying to find out and, and but using the knowledge that I had gained, uh, at, uh, at Marriott about customer service and support and, and listening and learning how to use your resources because you can't know everything. So the main thing is just, you know, you, you listen, uh, you write things down, and then you think, okay, who would know more about this than I do? And then you learn, and then you go and find that out. And then from there, you go to find that. And dad was always a big, huge resource for me. And th but then there were other people that were resources for me too. So um, I learned that at, at Marriott. But so you see Dion, here's Dion. Yeah, I, gosh, I know her forever. And she's still at DUI and, um, and there's Bob. I and see, I, 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 I count at, at least a dozen or more people, um, you know, that are still there working there at DUI. Um, oh yeah. And it's oh, interesting and to see everyone's like years ago. <laughs> and then Annette, Annette was with us forever. I don't know if she's still there. She yep, she's still there. She still decorates there. Uh, for every holiday, right? She would decorate yep. for every holiday. She still Here's does it. Today. Good. I'm so glad to hear that. I'm so glad to hear that. And Jeff, um, Je there's Jeff Smith uh, from planning and, and Jessica and Jeff and Dan Drake back here. And here's dad. Um, there's Carol. She taught me so much about dealing with the government. Um, <laughs> I remember the first time I think I said gun and she said, no, you do not say gun to anybody in the military. It's a weapon. Okay. <laughs> so, but I mean, she taught me a whole lot more than just that, but she definitely taught me that. I never said that again. And, um, but she was just amazing. And, um, and then Ch Charles and Sharam uh, working with them in accounting and uh, where's Pat Thomas? I, we're in this um, picture. Where's I, Pat? Is that her right oh, in front of your dad? Right there. Yeah, yeah, right there. I remember the one day when she said, Susan, you just sell it and we'll make it. 
And, and that was our deal for years. It didn't matter if we got a special order or uh, we had a rush order or, you know, when things, big orders would come in. I, I mean, some people look at it like, oh, we got all this work. Me, I'm like, yay! So we go and we plan and what can we do to get this done? So, uh, I mean, there was one year where we had, it was amazing. We had this huge military order, all these uh, waterproof bags and dry suits. And then we never missed a heartbeat delivering um, a customer's order, you know, just an, uh, a recreational diver's order, never. Because it was always about customer service. Um, it was always about whatever we can do, we're gonna find a way to make it happen. And like customer service, we had the one number, and actually you and I were talking about, I think it still think it lives there, like that main line that comes in on right. the phone. But I had that on my phone too. So if, uh, so if the phone was ringing and people were busy, I'll pick it up. And I remember one time somebody saying, hey, Susan, what are you doing answering the phone? I said, dude, it's ringing. So, um, uh, you know, it was always about the customers. It's always uh, the employees just, I know sometimes things you, you know, you run into times where, oh, I remember this one day when we had to downsize and it was, it was heartbreaking, you know, to uh, have to let some people go. Or there was one time um, where we lost a whole lot of people and doing uh, immigration. Uh, we, we did everything. The thing I loved about working, especially with Sharam, it was all about crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And, um, I never wanted to have to go to bed uh, thinking that what are we going to do in this instance or did we do something we shouldn't, you know, kind of been, you know, there's always different ways to do things, but we always did everything the right way. And, um, and I really appreciated that about him. There was one time when we had immigration come in and we had all of the right paperwork. Everything was, you know, on everybody and the people had been with us for years and we had everything documented. And then there was like this super duper audit or something that came in and they said, well, we're gonna do this audit and you'll find that some people will just leave because um, of whatever happens. And actually we lost like a, either a quarter or a third of our production staff. Mm. And we had to fill those places up and uh, uh, that was really challenging, but between Pat and Pam and Dion um, made it happen. And then there's Dan Drake, who's uh, doing a lot at DUI now. I think he's kind of running things at DUI. You know, we brought in um, Tommy, which when, when we decided to bring in uh, an automated cutting machine, that was huge. That was huge. Everything before then was cut by hand. Every pattern was by hand, traced out. Um, Dion would get the measurements and she'd say, do this, do this, and then the cutter would trace everything out and then cut it. And so that was really, so we decided, you know what, this is just, it was archaic and it took so much time. Plus, that's, that's a skill that's gone. You know, that takes real talent. So um, You had to pass on a lot of knowledge, especially yeah. if you lost people, right. um, retraining and, and get him so familiar with the process. So Bob and Dan, and Dan was really instrumental in creating the whole program where we could plug in measurements and things like that. That made a world, made a world of difference. And then also when we did, we did the floor, it was so great when we were able to knock down walls and we made everybody a bit, uh, able to work under one roof. That was amazing. So, but I, oh gosh, I've got to watch my time here. So I just wanted, to, this is important to me because so you can see and some uh, sewers and stuff are still there, just that this is really what it's all about. Then it was, okay, so this is a really cool picture, because really, I didn't think about it, but it was really a unique thing to have a lot of women in charge. And I, to me, it was just, we had the right people in charge. Um, it didn't matter what their gender was. And so here's a couple pictures. So myself and Carol, and my sister, Kathy, she was our webmaster. And then we've got Jackie in there, uh, Dion and Maria. She had been with DUI for years. She did the repairs. Pam was just a wealth of knowledge. She could see you. you if you met Pam, like at a trade show or something, and she had met you 20 years before, she'd look at the, 
you got the CF200 with that blue overlay, didn't you? And we did, you know, so she had an incredible memory. And then Faith, I can't even tell you enough about Faith because I used to, in addition to being um, amazing to work with, uh, she was fun. And uh, I got to go over to her house all the time for dinner. So she's amazing. So here's a picture too of the ladies. Uh, this was a few years later when um, we were doing something. We had bought an ad, Women Divers Hall of Fame. Oh, it was for their fundraiser for uh, a calendar. So Carol, myself, and then and Faith, and Patricia, and then Pam, and Dion, and Jan Jessica, and Janet. So it was a, a great pleasure to work with all of these ladies. And again, it wasn't because they were ladies, they were just the right ones for the job. So I have mentioned before that Carol taught me a whole lot about working with the military and uh, working with the Coast Guard. She had, she has such passion for taking care of her customers. I really admire her for that. And we used to come up with different pockets and, and then other than there's some of the things that are kind of different about, you will get a suit order and they want to put a pocket here or do something and they put pockets all over and then you say, why are you doing that? We can't tell you. <laughs> yeah, I've experienced oh, that. <laughs> the people up north, right? So, um, uh, but it was uh, it was great. One time I got to go. Uh, they were doing for waterproof bags. They were doing a test at Coronado, and it was so cool to be there and and uh, to see the products in use and the people that are using them. Uh, um, so it was really a, a privilege to do that. And thank you, Carol, for all of your help and support um, when I was learning all about that. So I, another, the cool thing about running the company is I always handled the marketing. And I love doing things like naming products, logos. Here's the old logo when I came in. It morphed a number of times, making catalogs and things like that uh, to add different words or to make it look different. Like one time I made it look like a metal coin, you know, and came and mm -hmm. uh, things like that. But this is that's the logo that you're using now. And I remember that was a bit of a bone of contention between my father and I. Uh, but uh, I think he, in the end, because I mean, we, I mean, that's one, that's what he came up with. So came up with that. I said, yeah, but dad, the, the DY is bigger. Look, it's bigger. <laughs> yeah, it has a, it has a nice look with the waves. It's, it's something that we can, um, from a marketing standpoint, use the waves. People start recognizing the waves, you know, the way in which they're laid out. We always wanted it to kind of be like it's the iconic Nike swoosh. Yes. You know, I know it's kind of big to compare it to that, but that's kind of the idea. Why invent, reinvent the wheel? Do you see something working for someone else? Hey, let's give it a try. So one a cool thing my dad did come up with was uh, the DY owners group, dogs, uh, like Harley Davidson and hogs. And so I got tasked coming up with a logo. So this was one of the logos we came up with, which was always a lot of fun. Um, okay, so one of the things I got to do too, I always coordinated the DEMA show, and that was always a highlight of the year, because uh, that's when we go, and, we, and not only do we meet with all of our dealers, but it was a pleasure. We really focused on meeting the end users. A lot of companies, you know, big dive companies, they only want to talk to their dealers. No, we love talking to everybody. We want to talk to you about how awesome our suits are. We want to get you in a suit, what kind, and, and all that. But so when I used to coordinate the show all the time. And one of the cool things was, is I always got to pick the shirts. And one year I made everywhere, everybody wear Sandia. So. so we went to red last year. We actually brought that back. Oh, okay. So this was actually a lot pinker. Oh, okay. You know, and I just so want to throw brighter. this in too. Whenever we did, we always did the group shot after the last day. I always had to round everybody up. There's those, oh, we're tired. I've tried to get everybody up. But I want to tell you right now, Bob Stint never sees this. Bob always made sure and sat next to me when we did a group shot, always. So, so another cool thing, how I loved making things. Working at DUI, I loved making things. I think that I, I liked that I did got to do so many, but coming up with ideas, coming up with, um, um, suit designs or what can we do sometimes it was what can you do that's small that could make a big impact right and so that's where some of the overlays came from the limited editions in which you were joking they're not very they're not limited 
but uh, it sounded good at the time. Uh, but what we the whole idea is to bring in some other patterns because the, the suits, I mean, you don't want to add more seams because more seams mean more problems, potential problems. So what can you do to a suit to kind of customize it and make it more personable? So we came up with some of the limited edition designs. So, so that was kind of an idea and the fact that we could get people working together on it. And then one day I come in because I'm looking and people are wearing jackets with the U.S. flag on them and stuff like that. I'm like, hey, why can't we make a suit like that? So then Bob and Dan, of course, they, um, they humored me <laughs> and started working on uh, the Team America design. So um, it wasn't captured, it was Team America. So you'll see they've got the lines going different ways. So Bob was working on the different overlays. So I mean, uh, and Dan, and that's Jeff. Jeff, he's no longer with us, but um, he was material planning and he was so good at what he did. Just amazing planning and scheduling. Yeah, we don't have the red and white stripes anymore. So that part's limited. That was actually limited. <laughs> that was limited. <laughs> so another thing I liked about uh, running DUI, uh, I go to the uh, um, boat show every year in Germany. And that's a nine-day show. And I remember when I first started going, uh, um, I was really kind of, I was humbled. I'd, I'd, go, I'd go and to the show like normal Susan. And then when I came back, I, I was almost hard to get my head in the airplane because I, it, I got such an ego boost while I was there. Because I'd go and I'd introduce myself, hi, I'm Susan Long from DUI. You know, just like I would do with anybody. they go, yes, I know. But it was so fun uh, working with the dealers from Europe. And because I would just bring me to Europe and they just have different ways of doing things. But I'm, it was fun to be able to engage with people um, and have fun with them. And one time we got, there's a big stage uh, in the one, uh, so this whole show, it's nine days long and, they, and it, it covers this whole huge convention center. One building is nothing but big yachts and then they'll have smaller boats and one building is nothing but surfboards or whatever. And so this was a one big hall with scuba diving and they had a big uh, center stage with a couple of different tanks and they'd have people testing gear uh, during the whole thing. So they said, okay, well, Susan, we want you to do, uh, they do these little 10 minute um, presentations. And so people would get up there and they'd be talking. A lot of it was in German or, and they'd be, you know, talking about things like, well, that sounds kind of boring. So uh, what I do, I made a fashion show. And then I'd get anybody I could. And it's so funny, I'd tell, I'd, tell, I'd get volunteers, some of the dealers, and who you think would be quite shy. Oh, no, they uh, ended up. Orin, Orin in the orange is definitely not shy. Oh, no, not him. But like uh, Peter from Germany. Right. And, uh, you know, they so, so I say, come out, you know, big shoulders. Come out, you know, just have a good time with it. And I had a ball, of course, being on this stage and um, making a backdrop. And I got to introduce everybody. And, yes, Orin would come out sometimes and roll across the stage and, so um, that was, you know, just doing fun things like that. You get all nervous and you get out there and just, because trying to do something, you know, like everybody else, but it wouldn't really work. So you might as well go the exact opposite. <laughs> and I remember somebody coming up to me, Susan, you're a rock star. Cause I'd come like really loud. Like, well, if you know me loud and then, and everybody else is just kind of, you know, European quiet. So <laughs> that was, that was, I, I like that. Although the show was exhausting. But. And then, of course, demo days, uh, I'd go to about a quarter of them a year. Those were wonderful events. Um, really, the, that is the brainchild of my dad and Faith. And when they started, uh, they were small and we'd ship suits around. Then we ended up getting a truck. Then we ended up getting a trailer. We'd have to put up two 20 by 40 foot tents with a you know jackhammer and we'd show up there and it would just like three of us or whatever the guys uh, Alan who was driving the truck and then we'd go and and we'd have, we'd get there and we'd look for people to help us set up the tents and so this is at Dutch Spring so we did those what for 16 years or something like that and it was such a wonderful way to interact with uh, with the divers and with the dealers a um, lot a lot of work but it was 
it was just, it, it worked out really well. I think it really made DUI stand out. Uh, it was part of DUI's secret sauce. Um, what made us special, because it wasn't all about, it was, wasn't all about the numbers and things like that, because you, know, you and I were talking about that. Where, how does, how do you judge where someone learned about the suit? Was it an ad or was it yeah. a demo day? Yeah. Or, you know, was it because they saw somebody wearing one at the beach and asked about it? And, uh, but that was a kind of a different time. I mean, uh, when we did that, there was a lot of cost involved. It was, again, it was hard work. Can you imagine getting up at 7.30 or 6.30 in the morning and turning wet suits, turn them inside out when it's, you know, 45 degrees out and, or then, or it's 90 degrees out. And, uh, um, but they were, um, they were a lot of fun. And I loved working with the divers. And I especially liked uh, starting, I set up a, a measuring station and I, I get to work with people. I'd measure them and then help them design. I love that. Help them design their suit. And everyone, it wasn't like, I, I ask questions, show them what's available. And they go, I didn't know that was available. Oh, yeah. And I remember one time, because when you talk about colors, at one time, somebody said, I was helping some guy, and uh, some man at the time. And he said, oh, I don't care what color it is. Um, you know, black is fine. And I said, well, we've got a really nice navy blue. He goes, navy blue? I love navy blue. So... <laughs> Oh, another thing that was really cool about working at DUI is sometimes we got to work with uh, uh, doing movies. So here's a picture. I didn't get to meet Drew Barrymore, but here's Drew Barrymore because she was in oh, that movie. Oh, with the whales. Yeah. Um, yeah. The whales in Alaska are, uh, it, yeah, where they're it's freeing big, the whales. Miracle, are... I think it was called. Yeah, with, and it was based on the true story. And that's Sylvia, who she was her stunt diver. Um, so they worked together. But that was, it was really cool. And then what was neat too about that is we were trying to make it as um, time relatable as possible. So like other people at DUI, probably Pam and Dion went looking for old patches. So we didn't put a new patch on a suit for the era. You know, so it looked like- Okay, so I was wondering about that because I, I, yeah. I looked at the suit and I went, wow, she's diving like an old TLS. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we did that. We did um, uh, The Guardian, where we made suits for Ashen Kutcher and Kevin Costner. Those suits, uh, they use them throughout the whole movie. We don't, unfortunately, we don't put patches on them because they, they, that's the government. They don't want that. But we had a really cool um, producer or the costume person that we were dealing with. And about midway through the movie, uh, there's this big scene with Ashton Kutcher and Kevin Costner, and they're in a locker room, and there's a DUI dry suit bag um, oh, awesome. on the locker. So that, that, that was really cool. And then, oh, one time, Pam and I, this was before that, uh, there was a movie called The Italian Job, and we got to put Mark Wahlberg in a dry suit. So we got to go up onto Paramount Studios and put Mark Wahlberg in a dry suit and just... He was just small, and we took two inches out of his leg. Then. <laughs> Secrets. <laughs> um, I've met so many really cool people because of just in the role. Uh, one time after a demo day, or I got um, Matt Johnston here, who's a quadriplegic. He reached out to me, and he was asking about dive gear. He'd always dreamed about scuba diving. And um, I kind of thought at the time, there's only so much I could do, but I can be a good pen pal. And so we became friends. And then uh, through that ended up, he became the first uh, ventilator dependent person to ever scuba dive. And that was a, a privilege to, but I've met just because of that, then I got to meet so many people like, um, like a, uh, John Chatterton. So he got involved in the project too, but it wasn't a project. I mean, we were just trying to help somebody. I mean, it, in the beginning is, uh, he wanted to go to a demo day and he, and he couldn't go, uh, or uh, no, he did a couple of years later, but so we sent him a dry suit to try on, you know, just to try on and wheel around his house in, right? And, and what mm -hmm. harm is that? And, and, and then through that, he ended up becoming, I said, hey, Matt, um, you know, this is your dream, so reach out, and you gotta make your dream happen, and he did, he really did. So if you'll see here through in the suit, um, 
we put uh, we just put a, a patch through there and people like Dion and Pam they're the ones that came up with that not me so uh, where the ventilator can pass through wow. and here's another thing here here's Oren and I and actually so GUE style diving is extreme though that was our our biggest client customer base it's, it's big in the US but especially big in Europe and we were contacted uh, by our distributor there about um, this man who it was, he wanted to learn how to dive. Um, he wanted it, but, uh, and he wanted a dry suit, but of course there were some limitations to it. And I said, hey, you know what? If anybody could do it, we could do it. So we had actually mocked up um, a, a suit without sealing it. We got his measurements and with Pam and Dion working on it and, and, and Dan Drake. So we came up with the design, sent it over, had him try it on and then let us know what needed to be changed. And then we did it, um, then sent it back and then we were able to make him a suit so he could dive like a GUE diver. And it, and some of those things, what, what special things, and sometimes we'd make things for kids who, you know, had stints or whatever, and they mm -hmm. wanted to be able to dive. And some people we could help, some people we couldn't help, but the people that we could help, it, it made all the difference in the world and, and our, crew of people really liked working on some of those special projects. I mean, they were doing something and you know, they were do always doing something important, but it was even more so. So designing things like we came up to our 50th anniversary. It was our golden anniversary. So we got to, you know, come up with a, let's make a gold patch, right? So, and then uh, what was really fun about that is people were like, well, I want a gold patch. Well, you'll have to buy another suit, won't you? <laughs> Jessica, yeah, Jessica wanted a uh, wanted one. So this is Jessica from Sales, and we're uh, we are really great friends to this day. She helps, um, so she has Sunshine Mermaid. So, oh, and then this was that was a really cool thing, and I I really was proud of that. Had I stayed at DUI, I really wanted to find a way to make it um, our dry suit app. So the my dry suit app, so you could they, we took all the overlays you could design your suit, different kinds of boots, pockets, of course, a pocket on a suit, it's a black blob on a black suit, but it was still fun to do. And then, uh, and I know that face doesn't look exactly like it should, but we were trying and things were a little, I'm trying to think when we came out, when we came out with us like 10 years ago or something. Um, but uh, the idea was to be able to get people through the whole process. When you can picture yourself in a suit, you know, it's kind of just through the whole sales process. And uh, I really enjoyed working on that. That was a fun project. Very, very, very detailed project. Yeah, we have a version of that, like that today now, right? on the website. Yeah, I, I need to check that out. Do you, do you have yeah. the leopard print oh, still? Uh, we, the limited edition leopard print, we still have. <laughs> <laughs> and I heard you have a big, huge bolt of zebra. Yes, just ordered the limited edition again. <laughs> <laughs> I got to be on the local TV show showing the hot water suits and the waterproof bags. Um, uh, so that was really fun. I got to be on a, a deep sea detective show. I remember this was way, this was a long time ago. I think I had first started running the company. Um, and I ran, actually, I was CEO of the company for 13 years. And uh, I remember they called and they said, hey, we want you to be on deep sea detectives. And I said, and I said, well, you know, my dad's really the one, the leader coming out with the dry suits and stuff like that. Uh, maybe he'd be better. He said, no, we really like your dad, but we want you. And because they were doing something with women divers and all that. And so that was, that was really fun. Uh, getting, you know, telling, they're telling me how to move my light underwater and stuff. So, oh, I remember this is the first time I ever saw a giant black sea bass. And uh, I got my picture taken with one boy, my dad. But he got me back later on. So yeah, no, he he uh, he likes he always in some of our meetings he has that as his backdrop with the giant black sea bass. <laughs> so I'll, we better hurry up and wrap this up then because I we're at two oh three already. So going into the present day, so I left the company about uh, a little over four years ago. You know, um, it was it was challenging. It was very challenging. 
And that's even being an understatement. When I left, it was the hardest part was when I announced to the staff that I was leaving. But um, my dad and I just, you know, we, we had very different ways of doing things. And it was, and it was just time. And so I left. And then I have a really good friend who owns a couple of liveaboards in Mexico. And uh, uh, before I, we worked together, we were great friends. Before we were great friends, I was a good customer. And I just, I want to point out that I've always had the privilege of working at places which I, I truly believed in. Um, uh, like DMI, the best dry suit in the world, period. You know, so you can hold your head up high. Uh, Marriott was a great company to work for. And now, uh, now that I'm doing this, I mean, I was a good customer because I remember, and I had been on a few other liveaboards, but I remember the first time I was on this liveaboard, and as the boat was coming back to, uh, the skiff was coming back to the boat, we were diving into coral, every, the, the engineer and the captain were back there to offload the tank. Everybody was working together. When you had dinner, the dive masters were downstairs asking you, what do you want to drink? Do you want a glass of wine or whatever it was? So the whole crew really worked together. And I really liked that. There was no hierarchy, right? And they were all there to work together to give you an amazing experience. So now that I work here, I, I again, I feel like I'm part of an, a, an, another amazing team. So I get to handle the sales and marketing, which is the funnest part of what I did at DUI. And now I get to do that for this, this wonderful liveaboard. So Did you redesign that logo? <laughs> uh, I was part of it, but actually that was Dora. Because okay, so I'm like on the, the, the wave swoosh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's funny because now um, we collaborate a lot and uh, I'm not in charge as much as I used to, you know, so I'd be able to make those split second decisions. But um, uh, it's a pleasure to work with her and to be a part of, of uh, this team of people. So I feel like the crew, I'm all, I'm a part of them. So anyway, so we have these two beautiful liveaboard dive boats and the boats are going right now. We're in the Sea of Cortez season. So right now in the summertime, we go to the Sea of Cortez and uh, one boat, Rocio del Mar, takes 20 divers, has 10 private cabins, each with an ensuite bathroom. And Kino is a little more casual in that it takes 16 divers, but has quad cabins. And then there's four community bathrooms um, that uh, get assigned to the, the rooms. But both boats have what we're best known for is the crew and the amazing food. I just got back from our third annual uh, all ladies uh, dive trip to the Sea of Cortez, Midriff Island, uh, that, which uh, benefits uh, Dive for Cure and breast cancer research. Just came back crossing the border. The only difference was um, we had to wear masks. So the pool's open folks and so now, so we're at Sea of Cortez season, then in November, we're going to start our Socorro season again. And uh, looking, really looking forward to that. Really looking forward to that. With the giant manta rays and that come right up to you, the, the dolphins, the bongos dolphins will come right up to you and almost get, uh, seem indignant if you don't try to, if you don't pet them. Uh, the seven different species of sharks, and uh, I'm supposed to go in November on a vacation and I have, cause I haven't been out there for years and I'm super excited. Yeah, this is still one of those areas that it's on my list to go to. And it's so easy for, especially for you, you know, flight down to San Jose del Cabo, it's easy. You know somebody, I can hook you up there. <laughs> there we go. So, um, so this is me, so I, I go to all the dive shows now, usually. Uh, and the neat thing about it is I don't have to set up 30 dry suits and grid work and, <laughs> and stuff that's a lot easier to go to a dive show now with a TV screen and some brochures. Yeah, you kind of, yeah, that's, I know what you mean by how much that work that is. That's something I've been doing the past couple of years and trying to get everybody coordinated to set things up. And I have my vision and then trying to make sure people follow that vision. Uh -huh. <laughs> is you know two different things but yeah no i i, I get it <laughs> it's yeah. a lot of it's a lot of work yeah well sometimes it would dy is you as you know you have to wear a lot of hats and a lot of times you could have the vision but you were also the one uh implementing that vision so that's but that's what happens in all small companies right yes
So here's just to show you, this is where the boats go. So this is the Sea of Cortez season right now uh, with the Midriff Islands. We leave out of Puerto Penasco and actually most people fly to Phoenix. Uh, so you actually get an international dive trip with a domestic flight. So you fly to Phoenix and then a shuttle picks you up at the airport and the, uh, about four hours later or so, four and a half hours later, you're boarding the boat in Puerto Penasco. It takes you right to the boat. And then, so this is an eight day trip and we get to dive with sea lions. I did two days with sea lions. I got my fin nibbled on. I'm never gonna wash it again now. And then, um, and we snorkeled with whale sharks in Bahia de Los Angeles. Saw some huge turtles, uh, millions of fish, eels and octopus, um, little blennies, nudibranchs, and you're just out there in the middle of nowhere. And it's just fantastic. So that's that. And then in September, we will start our uh, Explore Baja trips that do 700 miles. They go the entire length of Baja. So it's one way, and those are 13 day trips. And uh, so you get everything, you see everything up north. Oh, hey, I forgot to mention too, on this last trip, uh, we got to follow a big pair of sperm whale, not sperm, uh, fin whales for at least an hour and a half. So that was, that was a ton of fun. Then, okay, so then as I was, so that's, well, they've got the Explore Baja trip, that's one way, and that's a fabulous trip. Then in November through the end of May, we start our Socorro season and you fly into San Jose del Cabo and it's 250 miles offshore. And there's three, we visit Socorro, San Benedicto and um, Roca Partida out there. So here's the beautiful boats. And actually it's kind of fun. So, you know, you had a, uh, you did Rocio del Mar Perfect uh, where the boats get their name from Dora's daughter's named Rocio. So that's where that boat name comes from. And then Kino El Guardian, Kino uh, is her grandson's, first grandson's name is Joaquin, and they call him Kino. And where the Guardian comes from is about half of the trips we do on that boat are citizen science based, where we'll have a scientist on there. And coming up in November, we have Dr. Denny Ramirez, and she's known as the whale shark queen. And she is going to be attempting to ultrasound pregnant uh, manta rays and whale sharks. And so they'll do presentations, get the guests involved in the research. And uh, so that's why, where the El Guardian name comes from. So just like I had that beautiful picture of all the people at DUI, this is, this is my, um, we're actually trying to mold, put everything with the two boats under Mexico Liveaboard. So this is my Mexico so Liveaboard's family. And I will do everything I can to help support these guys and get people on the boat. I'll take care of the customers just like I did with DUI. Let's match you up, get you the trip that you want, and what can I do to help you, and all of that. Is that Janet? Yeah, Janet's working okay. with us. She's our guest, uh, our guest paperwork now. You know the the documents that you need prior to boarding. So it is fantastic to be working with Janet. Again. Okay, Janet used to work at DUI also. Yep. So I'm thrilled to be working with her again. And this was just a picture taken off of um, uh, Kino when we just got back from our all ladies trip for Dive for a Cure. And it was so much fun. And then here's me because, you know, I got to get pink stuff for Dive for a Cure. And it's just to show, you know, you got to be who you are and have a good time. Do what you can to have a good time. And this is a picture taken from me in my beautiful 3030 dry suit. Oh, I forgot to post the picture of my dog and I, Fiji. I remember years ago when I was at DUI, so normally this suit design doesn't have pink piping. And Pam made a, um, a matching jacket for Fiji. She loves Fiji, so my black lab mix had come to work with me. Then she made a, a matching jacket out of the skulls uh, for Fiji and put pink piping on it. And so since we wanted the suit to match, the dog and my suit to match, she found a way it was impossible before, but she found a way to add pink piping, not because the dog could match me, so I could match the dog. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, by the way, we, we actually do make um, dog jackets again, officially. That's really cool. <laughs> that's cool. Um, I love their dogs. So that's, a, that's something someone can order now, is they can get a dog jacket to match. Sweet. 
So that's pretty much uh, where I was going to leave it off at. So. Okay, uh, so can you switch off from sharing your screen? I can. So, okay. and I'm going to do this. So thank you for, for presenting today. That was awesome. Um, it, it definitely gave me a little more insight of where I work. Um, it's just a, a different perspective on this whole thing. So that's great. And thank you. Thank you for, for being part of the DUI family and, and, and presenting today. It was, it was great. It was my honor to listen to the, all the stories. It's just a, it's a different, different perspective, and I enjoyed it greatly. So, oh, so well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And you did get a lot of comments of people saying thank you and, and all the, and all the stuff that you're doing. So. Oh, well, thank I you. It. I see a thank you from Ivana. Ivana is my dive buddy. We met each other uh, a few years ago with her daughter on Kino El Guardian. They were, we had a trip with kids. Uh, well, they were doing a citizen science thing and Ivana and I became great dive buddies. So hi, it's so good to see her. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so that's what we have for, for this month. So thank you everyone for, everyone for coming out. Um, again, we will have another episode of Deep Dive with DUI next month on the first Thursday at 1 p.m. Uh, next month, uh, hopefully everything goes as planned. Um, it will be uh, Dan Wright. Uh, he'll be presenting on the Tilly Foster Mine and <gasps> the Andradoria. Awesome. So expect some incredible photos and some interesting tech diving rigs and just seeing what's going on with the projects he's working on. So again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out. Um, we'll have the, the YouTube version posted hopefully sometime next week. Otherwise you have the, the Facebook version to rewatch again right away. So thanks for coming out everyone and we'll see you next month. Bye. Thanks Jack. Yep, you're welcome. Thank you. Say hi to everybody at the office for me. <laughs> I will. Okay.